Did you hear about the uh, Super Saturday sales, Super Saturday stores? Uh, $34 billion was spent yesterday, and uh, it outsold Black Friday, which is 35 or $31 billion. Yeah, 31 is less than 35. And, uh, and so uh, I had to go out and get some blinds, so I went up to Lowe's, and uh, really difficult to get past Walmart. And uh, so I got past Walmart, went to Lowe's, came back out, and then I couldn't get past Walmart. And uh, I was sitting, sitting in traffic, trying to get down to Quarterfield and cross over to 97. And then, you know, it gets real crowded there and, and backed up. And then two ladies, one coming from Chick-fil-A and one coming wanting to go to Chick-fil-A, were right in the middle of the intersection. They couldn't go anywhere. I say, dudes used to do that, but now the women are doing it. And uh, so we're all just sitting there frozen. And, and when the light changes and the cars move up, I mean, an inch from their doors. And you can see the, the eyes are bulging out of their head. And, uh, and so, but you know, it's really no secret. It's not Super Saturday. It's for all those late shoppers, the last minute people all over the United States. That's what happened yesterday. But you know, all that happened because our Lord and Savior was born into this world. And so it's maybe commercial, makes a lot of money and prospers a lot of people, but it's because Christ came into the world. They would never recognize that, but we do, don't we? And um, by the way, my name is Clyde. I'm not Rick. And uh, he would say he is much better looking than I am. And uh, anyway, I'm minister. Amen, right? Somebody said amen when I said that. But I'm a minister of pastoral care here. Uh, if you're a visitor and you fill out a card, I usually send you like a little card with a Chick-fil-A gift card in it. See, I, I do that for you. But, but, the, but the sad news is also I visit you in the hospital, and also if you're sticking around long enough, I'll probably do your funeral. <laughs> but that's my role here at Severn Christian Church. <laughs> anyway, Rick started the, uh, the series, Home for Christmas, and I, I get to end the series today. And uh, on a serious note, um, God really has gifted us by sending the Bonifields here to Severn Christian Church. You know, in the Bible, there is the gift of preaching, and Rick really has it, doesn't he? He's an intelligent young man. He loves the Lord and loves the church. And uh, pray for him, because I heard somebody say a long time ago, it's always stayed in my heart, that a man of many talents and one of many talents has many temptations. And so with that, let's pray and get started today. Father, as we approach you, we recognize uh, because of Jesus, the world, the world changed. When he appeared, everything changed. Even in our politics today, Lord, there's a great suppression and oppression, Lord, of the gospel. Because it interferes like it did on the day that the wise men rolled into Jerusalem. It interferes with their politics. And Father, we know that when man drifts from God, there's chaos. And the gospel, was, they try to suppress it. But Lord, today we gather to worship you because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in his kingdom, that it will flourish as it has, as all other governments pass uh, and, 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 and do not prosper. Lord, they disappear right before our eyes, but yet the kingdom of God still stands, and it will until Jesus returns. And so today, Lord, as we examine the scriptures again uh, pertaining to his birth, Father, I, I pray that we will see as we examine the passages that worship took place on that great day in the days to follow, and 2,000 years later. And so I thank you and praise you through the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name that I pray, amen. And so here in your Bibles in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 8, I'm going to read the passages uh, that Linus actually uh, said in, in uh, Peanuts, uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas. And uh, he did it very eloquently, didn't he? And he focused the world in us, and still to this day, of the true meaning of Christmas. In that region, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there shall be born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And so we, we all have a tradition or orientation to Christmas that we practice this time of year. And like the people running around at the last minute shopping, it's craziness, isn't it? But we have a way that we celebrate, all of us. And uh, we have a certain orientation. And now uh, since my mom moved in, I figured out what mine was. And so after pulling down about 20 boxes of decorations from the attic for her, and then also realizing she was watching the Hallmark Channel, Christmas Channel, since October, I found out I'm a full-blooded Hallmark Christian child. <laughs> but growing up, Mom and Dad, they transformed our house with all the decorations. It was a classic Hallmark home, and my mom does the same thing when you walk in there uh, you feel it, but it is the glow and the wonder that Jesus brought into her life, transferred to my life and transferred uh, to your life. And so they decorated trees and the lights were everywhere and trimmings on the doors and the railings and the windows. And each year my father made a train garden and uh, it's still a heritage. Uh, we didn't have any room in our house for a train garden, so I built one around one of the rooms in the house and that train runs around there, just a tradition. And uh, it was four boys in our house, and so there were four stations, distinct stations for our toys and uh, that they had for us each Christmas when we would come down. Then you add Charlie Brown and Rudolph and the Grinch and uh, White Christmas, and it's a wonderful life. And so Christmas is a wonderful time of year, incredible experience that we try to capture each year, don't we, according to what we've, the traditions that have been passed down. That orientation influence is still with me, and I'm sure it's still with you. But the worship of Christ at his birth brought perspective to really what all that's about. And so it came in sort of like waves and, and, and sort of uh, snapshots as I was growing up. But uh, do you remember your first white Christmas? I was six years old. And our tradition was to go next door because my grandmother lived right next door. I'm telling you, for grandsons, that is great. Grandma, I'm right next door. And we would have Christmas Eve there. And of course, for us kids, it's like, ah, presents here, and then presents when Santa Claus comes in the morning. So it was like a double barrel Christmas. But I remember it was a white Christmas, and my father had to shovel from our house over to my grandma's house, and he covered, uh, carried each one of us boys over there. I was the last one. I was sick that year, had rheumatic fever, terrible sickness. All your bones ache and your muscles ache, and you can, tell, you can ask my mom. I cried most of the time. It was a really difficult time, probably more for her than maybe it was for me. She had to put up with it. But anyway, we went over there, and uh, you have the dinner. Grandma makes dinner. And my grandma was the type of person, she wanted to please everybody, so we had three meats along with everything else. And then everybody's favorite dessert. It just filled, as soon as you came in the house, you could smell all the food and desserts mixed together. So it was just a grand time. But that particular Christmas, because of the, 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 the problems I was having physically as a kid, you know, the thought comes to your mind, am I going to die young? You know, you're, 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 you're afraid, you know? And, uh, and so I was in more contact with God. People would pray over me and everything and had a little plaque, and you know, now lay me down that one. The kids pray. They change a little bit because that one says, if I die before I wake, and now they don't say that. They say, if angels take me home. And that's a better idea, isn't it? All right, I'm getting off track here. But anyway, so that, so that Christmas, it was the same old thing. You got six boys on the, on the floor and wrap, unwrapping presents. The, the paper's getting deep and everything, and you're still looking for more presents. And then I looked on the manual, and every year it was there. She put a manger scene on the manual on, on her fireplace. And for some reason, it just caught my attention at six years old. And my grandmother told me the story behind the real meaning of Christmas as she told, showed me her manger scene. And then when I became a Christian in 1982, it was at Joptown Christian Church, and they had a Christmas play. And uh, if you've seen the Miracle of Christmas, you've been to any type of plays, and we, we've done them here at the church and everything, there's something about the human touch when you see that Christmas play and you see the birth of Jesus done over again. And I was just emotional the whole time. I couldn't, I just cried. And the realization hit me, you know, what Christmas was all about. And then the Christmas Eve service, it captured the celebration of that first 
day when Jesus was born so long ago. Read scripture, what we're going to do here on Christmas Eve, and, um, and uh, sing and pray and just remember what the Lord had done when he came to the earth. For me, Christmas begins not when you first see the decorations and start buying things at the store and start on your house and everything, but it begins on that Christmas Eve night when we come together as God's people, sing praises, read the scriptures, and remember what God has done. So as God granted us liberty, we try to capture that each year, and it just begins the real spirit of Christmas for me. So at the birth of Jesus, as we just read one of the passages, it caused a reaction of worship. So at his appearing, as it is his as appearing right there in Luke chapter 2, 13, it said, an angel appeared, gave the message of goodwill to the shepherds. Then a heavenly host, a choir of angels, began to sing as the glory of God would shine all around them. It's really amazing, but in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, it speaks of a prophecy spoken long ago in Psalms 97, 7, where it says this, Let all of God's angels worship Him. So the angels were not designed as a messengers to us and to the world and to watch over us. They were to worship the Lord Jesus, and they did that very thing right there at His birth. But also in 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 12, in Luke 15, 7, it explains this. It says that the angels long to look or to observe the salvation that takes place here on the, on the earth. So they're looking down. They're seeing God's plan at work. But also Jesus reminds us there in Luke as well that there's rejoicing before the presence of God over one sinner that repenteth. You've heard that before, haven't you? And so here's the idea. They worshiped him at his birth, and they worship every time a sinner comes back to God and is saved to this very day. So the angels are active in the birth of Jesus and in the gospel work that he presented when he came to the earth. Then it said the shepherds went away glorifying God and praising him. That's worship. You see, worship isn't what just happened here a few minutes ago. Worship is something that you can do every day, all the time. Whenever, whenever you put your attention on God is an opportunity to praise Him and thank Him. We have myriads of things, reasons to thank Him, don't we? Many reasons to praise Him. And so the shepherds went away praising Him. Matter of fact, they told everybody they came in contact with. And they told Mary and Joseph first as they came in. And so in the Bible also, the apostles, it's really amazing, one time they actually fall down and worship Jesus. And sometimes this will cause you to worship him too. Remember when it was? They're in a great storm, right in a little tiny boat. Jesus is sleeping. Storm comes up. These guys have been on the water their whole life. All of a sudden, they're afraid. They think they're going to perish. They wake him up. He says, oh, ye men of little faith. It wasn't his time. And it says he stopped the wind, stopped the waves, and they worshiped him. You see, when we find tribulation, when we get in those storms of life, guess what? First thing we think of is worship Him because we can't solve this problem ourselves. And so the shepherds uh, worshiped Him. The apostles worshiped Him. The wise men came into town in, Ma in Matthew chapter 2, and here's what they said. Now, they didn't know. Uh, they, Herod probably had a reputation, but they had no idea the danger they were in. But look, look at verse 2. It says, we saw, here's the announcement they made to Jerusalem and to Herod. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. No bones about it. We came to worship the king. Verse 11 says, After coming into the house, they saw the child marry his mother, and they fell to the ground, and they worshiped him. So they didn't come to worship Herod, did they? They didn't bring gifts to him. That was reserved for the Lord. That's why we sing, Fall down on your knees. And praise him. Oh, hear the ancient voices. But also on the eighth day, when he was presented at the temple to be circumcised, there was a man named Simeon. He was, a, uh, he was actually on the, uh, it was his opportunity, his turn, to do the circumcision of the children who come in, who were born and uh, come in on the eighth day. And uh, he participated in that. But God told him he would not see death until he was introduced to see the Lord's anointed. And so when Jesus was brought in, Mary and Joseph brought him in, 
And then Simeon came in for the Holy Spirit, says, and he blessed God. You see, he worshiped the Lord. And here's the words from his very mouth. For my eyes have seen his salvation. And so he glorified God, and he went away knowing that he saw the Messiah. He could go in peace. So worship was at the center of his birth. God surrounded Jesus with praise and honor and prophecy and singing. So we're going to celebrate Christmas just a few days from now. And again, we desire to capture the glory of that time and fill our hearts with what truly Christmas is all about. But let me read a passage for you in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 and 10. And I want to put the emphasis on verse 10 when I get there, because Jesus gives us more reasons to worship him outside of his birth, which we saw on that time. Notice what it says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. This is Paul talking to Timothy, writes to him. But join me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our, the, our, our works, but according to, uh, to his own purpose and grace, which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the first thing we see from this verse is that Jesus came to abolish death, to destroy death. You see, the Savior came to die so we wouldn't have to deal with the aftermath of death. Every day, every day, in the United States, 140,000 people die. Now, what makes that more than a statistic if that somebody is your father or your mother or your sister or brother or a child? Someone said this, when your parents die, they take the past with them. When the children die, they take the future with them. When any loved one dies, they take part of us with them. When C.S. Lewis lost his wife, Joy, to cancer, he said this, and I quote, he said that the pain of her loss was not localized to certain places or certain times, but that her absence was like the sky spread over everything. So every death is a loss. And loss brings pain, doesn't it? The pain caused by death is, in fact, the price we pay for loving someone, isn't it? Now, Jesus did not do away with death. It's the penalty for sin, isn't it? That's a problem we brought on ourselves. We allowed the devil to deceive us. We allowed our own flesh to give in from the holy principles of God. But what Jesus did is he did away with the impact of death. We still have to go through it. But Jesus deactivated death. Remember the Apostle Paul, at the end of his ministry, he struggled. He said, it's good if I stay because I still share the gospel and the ministry of discipleship. But it's far greater, far better to leave and be with the Lord. You see, the impact of death for him was gone. You know, we have the same choice, don't we? You know, a lot of times Judy and I talk, this world is just ridiculous, isn't it? Isn't it getting crazy? The people who lead us, you know, I don't have words for it. Do you? They call it the swamp and other things. But the representation is that there anymore. There's there's just an agenda. And it really isn't for the good of all the people. Wasn't it nice when the angels sang? The good will for all men, because God has favor for us. Isn't that what our representatives are supposed to have? Favor for the people? We've lost that, haven't we? But see, Paul understood that the impact of death was taken away and abolished by Jesus. When he rose from the dead, there was 500 witnesses, plus the apostles. And they wrote about it. And one of the things that Paul taught us in Romans chapter 6 was this. At baptism, you're not only united in the death of Jesus to get rid of your own sins, to die to your own sins, but we're also will be raised from the dead as he was raised to the glory of the Father. 
Then we walk in newness of life. That's, that's what we're in right now. If you've been baptized into Christ and you've repented of your sins, you're living like a Christian, you look forward to the new life, the resurrection of your life. That should take away the impact and the anticipation of death, shouldn't it? It should give us the hope that we need. See, death is the gateway to the power of the resurrection. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul has to help people understand the resurrection. So he talks about the various kinds of life, and he talks about human life, and the idea that God will translate and transform our bodies. How quickly? As fast as you blink, God transforms your body. Now, that's a power we don't see, do we? But it's a power we hope in. It's a power that brought Jesus back. It's a power that the Holy Spirit is capable of transforming your body from physical to spiritual. And it happens like that. And listen to this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul talks about this idea. When Jesus returns, he brings the saints who have gone before us with him. And then it says, we'll meet him in the air. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to go too far off the ground without my new body. So I'm thankful that it happens that fast. But see, it's hard for our minds to wrap around that thing. It's not, it isn't a movie. It isn't fantasy. The Bible tells us this resurrection moment, this translation of our bodies will take place. You see, that should abolish the impact of death. Because Jesus did away with it when he rose from the dead. Paul said it this way. He asked the question, oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is now a victory because of the resurrection. He answered the question himself. He said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have reason to worship the Lord at Christmas, don't we? The sting of death, the pain of death, is done away in victory. The relief of death and the pain of death now can be consumed by the hope and anticipation of the resurrection. Jesus appeared, fulfilled his mission, didn't he? And he abolished death. Listen to this passage in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also partook of the same. In other words, he came in the flesh, as we know. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And might free those who through the fear of death were subject to the slavery all their lives. You see, Jesus rendered the devil powerless as a murderer because of the resurrection. And the effect should be that now we're free from the fear of death. We're no longer subject to it. You know, performing funerals for many years is bittersweet. Loss and grief is difficult to comfort. But the sweet and most pleasant part is when you hear the testimony before the person passes on, the Christian. They say, I'm ready. Remember Elma Gray? She was so ready. Priscilla, before she lost her mind, so ready. They were ready for heaven's rest, heaven's healing, heaven's comfort. They were ready to meet their loved ones and then the Lord. You see, they no longer were subject to the fear of death. And see, the devil, the devil lost when Jesus came out of the grave. And so the power, the power is gone also from us. We are freed from the fear of death. So we're going to celebrate on the night of Jesus' birth. And so we have one more reason to worship found in that verse, verse 10. Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So Jesus abolished death. Excuse me, I dropped my cap. He defined life and immorality, which will be the absence of death. So I don't know about you, but my brain has a difficult time wrapping around the idea and the reality of living forever. Now, the original language 
actually says instead of the word live forever or the idea live forever or or, um, immortality, it uses the word without corruption. Now that I can hang on to a little bit because it's the idea that we will no longer be tempted by sin. There will no longer be any corruption to take our body. So it fails and gets old. That will be gone. But what we don't completely understand, I want, don't you? You see, the soul that God put in us wants that eternal, the immortal time, doesn't it? It wants that perishable turned into the imperishable, doesn't it? And uh, this body's breaking down. And uh, it's, you know, my hair actually used to be here. My <laughs> hairline used to be here. And it, and it used to be very brown at one time, you know. It just, it just changed. And, uh, you know, I look at pictures and, um, and, and, you know, the pictures on your phone, you know, they say they're getting better. Now they've got three lenses and all this stuff. All those dudes look like pumpkin heads unless your hairline's down here. That's just the way that you can take that phone and go like this. It just doesn't matter. It, it, it just isn't there anymore. But um, you've heard of the three Bs. I added one. Uh, bunions, bifocals, balding, and bul- bulging. As I added that one right there. But I want the part, (laughs) I want the part where there's no more sorrow from grief and loss of our loved ones. I don't want to perform another funeral as a minister. I'm sick and tired of being sick, aren't you? And, uh, you know, right now I hear some people coughing. I still, you know, I've been worried since I got up here, I might start hacking. I got my water here, right? But, uh, you know, Knox stuck his finger right in my mouth. And his fingers are everywhere, as Rick tells you. you know, right in my mouth. Now I've had his cold for a while. But look, aren't you sick of diabetes and disease and cancers and all these things? You know, I want to eat from the tree of life and not die. You know, food's been killing us for a while, hasn't it? You know, bacon really killed my father. We ate bacon every day, heart disease. So you throw heart disease and bacon together, it's not good. But you know, I want to eat sugar and not get fat, don't you? Wouldn't that be good? You know, I'm tired of paying for health insurance. I know I could stop right there, but car insurance, life insurance, house insurance, funeral insurance. And I thank God for the insurance of everlasting life, aren't you? And it's amazing that we have no payments. Jesus paid it all. We have the insurance of everlasting life. I want that. And when Christmas time comes, sure, I'll take all the gifts you want to give me. But I want to sing and worship that Jesus saved me for everlasting life. Whatever you give me, it could be L.A. Fitness. I'm not going. <laughs> I'm getting a new body. You, you can go if you want. I'm not going. But you know what? I can't wait to run and not grow weary. Remember that? Like these young kids just run and run, hair flying, feet off the ground. You feel like you're flying. I can't wait to read without dyslexia. See, you didn't know that, that I had dyslexia, did you? Of course you did. I read terrible publicly. It's terrible. But that's all going to be gone. And I can't wait to be as good looking as Rick, man, when I get there, have his body. And I want want Toby's body. That's the body I want right there. You know? Now, I will take some extra hair, though. I do like like Toby's physique. But you know what? I can't wait. Judy and I to see our babies. And you know what? I don't know if he's going to let us raise them. I don't know if they'll already be born. I don't care as long as they look like her and not me. That's, that's all I'm looking forward to. But I can't wait to be as innocent as a dove and whiter than snow. You know, we could make a a list a mile long of the troubles that will cease when we pass into eternal life. And how about this? What about all the necessities that will cease because of perfect health? Dr. Romanowski, you have to try another profession. No doctors, no nurses, EMTs, first responders, pharmaceuticals. I see CVS is going out of business. What's that all about? You see, when they dried up the painkillers and opioids, a lot of these places are going out of business. That was their big bucks. People's pain. We won't need them anymore, will we? And you know, we won't need Johnson & Johnson. 
I'm really going to miss those superhero band-aids, aren't you? (laughs) In Sunday school class, we came across the passage in Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says, God put eternity in the hearts of human beings. That tells you two things. One is, every human being you meet will have this drive within them for eternal life. If you don't find it in Jesus, all the other major religions have this concept and idea to satisfy the human soul, which God put eternity in there, to find life after death. Because God put it in there. He put eternity in our soul. So we decided to to study every passage with eternity, the concept of everlasting life for eternity, and we found 86 passages in the Bible, and we took three weeks to study it. Now, we're not experts, but here's what came out of that. It brought a peace. It brought hope and security. And it changed our attitude about the current political issues we're in right now. Because, see, we see Jesus looked beyond all this mess to the everlasting life that he gave us. Now we know why the angels worshipped him. Now we know why the shepherds worshipped him. Now we know why the wise men bowed down and worshipped him. There's just one group left. Will we worship the Lord as part of Christmas? Or will we let it be the thrills of Christmas? Did you hear about the St. John's property right here in Maryland? So St. John's property, pro- properties, uh, they had a goal Many years ago, it took them 35 years to meet that goal to sell X amount of properties and rental properties. And then the next goal was met in 14 years. So the owner said, you know, we've done so well, let's give all the workers in the business extra bonus this year. He said, how about a million dollars? They said, no. How about $10 million? And so these people had their big party. And they started opening their envelopes, and people started, some were celebrating, some were crying, some were like, there's no way. So the person who worked there for five years, every person got $10,000 for each year they worked there. The lowest was $50,000. But some lady had been there for 27 years. $270,000. She says, this changed my life. (laughs) They were kissing over those owners like you wouldn't believe. These guys were like the Messiah had come to their business. But there's going to be a last day for all the world. And in that last day, it'll be the greatest celebration that you've ever experienced. And you can do Christmas up any way you want. And you can get the biggest bonus you could possibly imagine or dream of but it will not compare to what's coming next. I'm going to read a small passage from Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 through 14 in a minute here. But isn't it amazing? We do try to capture the celebration of his life, and we should, because it was a worshipful moment when it happened. God let it be known that his son appeared and had a mission, and he fulfilled that mission. Now, raise your hand if you've been in sight and sound and have seen Miracle of Christmas. Okay. If you haven't seen it, get there. Because here's, here's what I want to tell you. They, they bring a celebration at the end. It's just amazing. They get as many voices singing as they possibly can of all the people who are part of those plays. And they have a stage that goes wraps up all the way around to the back of the building. And they fill both stages and the whole front and angels come down from the ceiling singing to the Lord and worshiping. It's quite a sight. And if you ever go on YouTube and look up Christian hymns or Christmas songs or songs written about Jesus, worship songs, sometimes they'll fill a whole entire stadium, 100,000 people, and they'll sing Hallelujah Chorus or something, something amazing. We're like, wow. And Mary Jo was just there. She just saw the place. It just gave her chills to see it. But as we read this next passage, I want you to see that God has something else in mind greater than the world could ever produce. And I'm sure he's happy what we're trying to do. But notice this passage here, starting with verse 11. 
just a little bit of background. Before the last day or the end of the age, uh, before Jesus returns, God has a book that has to be opened. It has seven seals around it. There was nobody in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every possible place you could think of that humanity could be. There was no one, not one person worthy to open that book. And without that book open, the end, the last day will not come. So someone had to be worthy, become worthy. Who do you think it was? And then I looked. Now take a moment. So we have sight and sound. We have hallelujah chorus. Uh, I like the Mormon, tack on the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I like listening to this time of year. It's big. And it's strong. And it's about Jesus. But nothing matches what's about to happen here. Listen to the context of what's happening. And when I looked, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders, and the numbers of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. That's just the beginning of the numbers. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing, hear that? Think of all the things that have been created by God under the sun, and especially from the beginning, which is in heaven. See, we don't see all that, do we? Every created thing in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all things in them and heard them saying this, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the, 24, and the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped him. If you were to look it up, I didn't look it up, how many times people prostrate themselves and fall on the ground before the Lord? One of them was young Isaiah. God called him to preach. He fell down immediately because the glory of the Lord is too much for us. So I believe that he gave us the story of Jesus' birth to celebrate it one way, and that's worship. So I pray that as we have that evening service coming up this Tuesday, the night before, or the, the, to celebrate his birth, that that will become your start of the Christmas celebration. So stand with me. I want to pray, and we'll be led in worship.